This is a study by a young artist of his head, looking at it closely in the mirror. It might seem a straightforward work, yet it is curiously arresting. It gives a sense of the spiritual, as though we are looking through the dreamy face to the mind behind. But it also has physical presence. The soulful eyes and broad intellectual brow are counterbalanced by firm, sensual lips and a slightly jutting jaw, expressing determination, even a hint of belligerence. The picture was drawn nearly 200 years ago in the 1820s, yet for many it has a contemporary feel, an image not far removed from that of teenage rebels and dreamers of our own times. This video will explore this drawing and its history. It will suggest how it came into being and consider what it might have to tell us of the artist who created such a remarkable image of himself. But first, there's a surprise. The picture was not created by an artist famed for painting people. He made very few portraits, and none of the others that survive are anywhere near as good as this one. He was a landscape painter. Samuel Palmer is best known for his vivid evocations of the English countryside, as in this celebrated picture known as the Magic Apple Tree. He worked at a time when landscape painting was at its heights in this country, he was a younger contemporary of the famous painters Turner and Constable. This was the period of the Industrial Revolution, and Palmer was one of those who reacted against the growing urbanisation and commercialisation of the age, seeking to counter this with celebrations of the rural community that was increasingly under threat. So why did he move away from such work to produce this image of himself? Self-portraits can be made for many reasons. Often, particularly in the past, artists would use them as a form of advertisement. This is the kind of portrait that was produced by Sir Joshua Reynolds, first president of the Royal Academy and most revered historic British artist in Palmer's day. In this picture, painted when he was at the height of his power in 1780, Reynolds shows himself wearing the robes of his doctorate from the University of Oxford, a sign of his intellectual status. He rests his left hand beside the bust of the artist from the past he admired the most. This is Michelangelo, the great master of the Italian Renaissance. Reynolds is suggesting that he is worthy of being at the head of his profession, a guiding light to others in Britain. But artists also draw or paint themselves as a means of studying the human form. The great figure painter of our own day, Lucian Freud, talked of the infinite availability of the subject. Normally, to draw a figure you have to get someone to sit for you, even pay them. But with a self-portrait, all you have to do is to ask yourself. For young and impecunious artists, this is a compelling reason. At the time he made his self-portrait, Palmer was young, probably no more than nineteen and was still learning the rudiments of his craft. Although already a landscape painter, he had ambitions to paint religious subjects involving figures. He went to life classes and drew from the antique in the British Museum. This is probably why he decided to make a study of himself, to use himself as a model. The technique of the drawing is one frequently used for figure studies. It is a chalk drawing on toned paper. Two chalks are used, a black one to draw the main lines and deep shadows, a white one to pick out the highlights. The middle ground of the paper provides the body of the form. The dark and light give it a sense of volume and the effect of light. Here is an example of such a self-portrait study by Reynolds. It is quite different in effect from the grandiose self-portrait used to advertise his profession. Here he observes himself as an object, as Palmer was to do later with his study. Yet in doing so, there is an interesting difference of attitude. Reynolds is observing himself studying. There is discernment in his expression as he tries to capture his features. There is little of the self-questioning that comes across in the Palmer. This difference is to some extent due to a difference of generation. Reynolds was a man of the Enlightenment in the 18th century. He was sceptical about innate abilities. 
He thought artistic excellence was achieved by hard work and the imitation of established masters. Palmer was of the romantic generation, full of belief in intuition and the inner life. He would doubtless have approved of the remark of fellow romantic, the German landscapist Caspar David Friedrich, that the artist must paint not only what he has in front of him, but also what he sees inside himself. By the 1820s, when he drew this self-portrait, the image of the artist tormented by inner imagination and feeling was fashionable. This can be seen in the self-portrait of another contemporary, the great French history painter Eugène Delacroix. Delacroix gives himself a troubled air, as though moved by complex emotions. This is certainly closer to Palmer's self-exploration than was Reynolds' more objective view of himself. But it is not quite the same. Delacroix's image might, when viewed at first, seem to be spontaneous and intuitive, but it is actually a carefully planned work. He is playing a role. He is fashioning himself according to the modish image of what a romantique was then supposed to look like. What is striking about the Palmer self-portrait, by contrast, is that it seems unplanned. He has started drawing himself as an academic exercise, as Reynolds has done. Yet as he worked with himself, something else came out, something unpremeditated. Perhaps this happened because he was going through a time of crisis in his life. The crisis was one that determined his whole future, and also incidentally led to him producing the kind of work for which he is now famous. Palmer had been something of an infant prodigy as an artist. He had had work accepted for exhibition in 1819 when he was only 14 years old. This portrait, by his friend Henry Walters, shows him at this time. He is presented as the well-dressed young Taro, already with his fashionable quiff in front. Behind him, proudly, is a landscape. This is the kind of professional portrait that we have already seen Reynolds producing. It shows none of the introspection of the self-portrait. After 1819, Palmer continued to exhibit and was reasonably successful in selling picturesque views. It was the time when English landscape painting was at its height, with Turner and Constable as its heroes. Palmer was one of the many following in their wake. Yet while his career was going reasonably well, Palmer fell increasingly into depression. Yes, he was doing well, but was he doing anything worthwhile? Producing fashionable picturesque views, was that all he wished to do? He was a man with deep literary and musical tastes, intellectually curious, strongly religious and spiritual. He felt that all he was doing was servicing the tastes of mammon. He faced a crisis that occurs to many young artists after they have realised that they have talent and met some success. What should they do now? Go on producing works that sell, that have a ready, well-established market? Or should they risk all and strike out on their own? see what they really had to contribute. This was Palmer's crisis. This was when fate threw him a lifeline. He met an older artist, John Linnell, who shared his interest in the spiritual in art. Linnell was an accomplished landscape painter, but he was also an enthusiast for the works of the Middle Ages. Like many in his time, he was looking back to the age of faith to find a society and art that had a vision lost in modern, more materialistic times. One of his great heroes was the 16th century German artist Albrecht Dürer. He took Palmer to see some of Dürer's prints in the British Museum, and this totally transformed the younger artist's way of looking at landscape. This flight into Egypt by Dürer became a favourite of his. Here is a design made by Palmer after seeing Dürer. You can see how he is now exploring form differently, using bold lines and enjoying creating rich textures with thick ink. His whole way of seeing the world has become more vigorous and elemental. He would have said that it had also become more spiritual, conveying an enthusiasm for the divine power that had created the world. But there was more to come, for Linnell was also an enthusiast for a great contemporary who also shared a love for the Middle Ages. 
This was the visionary artist and poet William Blake. Most contemporaries found his complex work unfathomable and dismissed him as a harmless madman. But Linnell saw the grandeur of his vision and played a key role in supporting him in his final years. Palmer was overjoyed to meet Blake, both for his art and also for the inspiring example of an artist who stuck to his own way of doing things despite the indifference of the world. Blake was old by now and had endured a life of exclusion and poverty, yet he persisted without rancour. When they met, Palmer talked of how, when trying to paint, he felt fear and trembling. Oh, said Blake, then you will do. So it was under such inspiration that Palmer changed his manner to paint works guided by the imagination. These did not go down well with the public. When one was shown in the Academy of 1825, the only reviewer who mentioned it suggested that Palmer should show himself alongside it so we could understand what kind of creature had made them. It was fortunate at this time that Palmer was thrown another lifeline. This was a legacy from his grandfather which gave him the means to retire to the country for seven years to work out his art in isolation. This is when he produced the works that are the basis of his fame today, giving a unique vision of the countryside that has remained an inspiration to artists, poets and country lovers ever since. He became the centre of a group called the Ancients, who looked back to the Middle Ages for inspiration. Here is a portrait of Palmer at the time by his fellow Ancient and close friend George Richmond, as you can see, Pum has thrown himself into the part with long hair, beard and flowing robes. None of the other ancients went so far, and the others even thought him rather comic for it. Richmond's idealised portrait of Palmer has to be matched by the same artist's caricature of him as Sambo, seen from the back in a ridiculous hat and coat, absent-mindedly holding his umbrella upside down. In the end, the dream ended. Palmer's money ran out and he had to come back to London. He and his fellow ancients had received no acclaim for their work. It is sad to reflect that twenty years later the Pre-Raphaelites made a similar rebellion for which they all became famous. But then they had the critic John Ruskin to support them. The ancients had no one. Gradually they all went their ways and continued for the most part modest and more conventional careers. In later life, Palmer modified his style to a more conventional and wistful evocation of the beauty of nature. He achieved a modest success with this, but he was no longer a revolutionary innovator as he had been in his early years. Palmer's self-portrait is the record of his moment of rebellion, when he was deciding to move away from the conventional art of his times to a new and bold manner inspired by Blake and the Middle Ages. He kept the picture by him all his life. It was preserved together with other early works in what he called his curiosity portfolio in his studio. He only showed the contents of this portfolio to old trusted friends and the occasional sympathetic newcomer. Palmer's self-portrait remained unknown to the public, in fact, until 45 years after his death when it was lent by the artist's son to the first major showing of Palmer's work held at the Victoria and Albert Museum in 1926. This was the exhibition when the full glory of Palmer's early achievement at Shoreham was uncovered for the first time, establishing him as a leading innovator in the Romantic period. Most attention was paid to the Shoreham work, but the portrait also fascinated people because of its address, its directness. The wood engraver Robin Tanner was one of the young artists overwhelmed by Palmer at this exhibition. Reminiscing later, he wrote, The self-portrait of Samuel Palmer as a young man which his son had lent I found strangely poignant. Never before, I thought, had a man's portrait so mirrored his work. I knew the Shawman drawings, so heavily charged with feeling, and that they could only have emerged from such a poet. Tanner's view is one shared by almost every subsequent commentator. It has become the symbol of Palmer's work, 
an unforgettable image of the dreaming, self-questioning artist. It was in the Romantic era that the painter joined the poet as a witness of the soul. In that sense, Palmer's self-portrait presents a new kind of artist who has remained important to us ever since. Yet for all that, it is also a real picture of compelling physical presence. I think a sign of this is in something that the artist may not have deliberately intended. This is its messiness. While beautifully drawn, Palmer has seemed careless either when making the work or storing it, for there are random marks and scuffs on it, and worst of all, a splodge of liquid white on the lapel of his coat. This is quite typical of Palmer. Many of his works have a scruffy look, with scratches and splodges all over the place, like this. I like this. There are some artists who are pristine and clean in all they do, but there are others who just get on with the work with vigour and don't mind about the odd upset that occurs in the process. Turner was like that. There are messes all over his work, and he was always grubby himself. There is a story that Turner was once introduced to an amateur painter who described himself as an artist. Show me your hands, said Turner. The man showed him his hands. They were clean. You are no artist, said Turner. Turner's hands were never clean. He even kept a thumbnail especially long so that he could use it to gouge lines into his watercolours. This grubbiness in Palmer reminds us of his earthiness. He may have been an idealist and a dreamer, but he is also vigorous and earthy in his art. This is what gives it its wonderful sense of presence. It is a work in progress, as alive today as when it was first made.